being on the stage in the youth room over there, talking to these guys up here. Um, one is, I talk ridiculously fast, and I apologize in advance for that. Who remembers the Micro Machines guy? Remember the Micro Machines commercials? A couple of you? The Micro Machines were these tiny, like, Hot Wheels cars. They're itty-bitty, and this guy on the commercial would just talk as fast as he could, telling you all about these tiny Micro Machines, as he was known as the Micro Machines guy who would talk horribly fast. Uh, people told me that I am reincarnated of him somehow because I talk so stinking fast. It usually gets worse when I get excited. When I start talking about Jesus or how much he loves us or something that really I get passionate about, I talk so fast, it'll all, everything will blur together and you, you get my permission right now to give me the sign. Say, Nick, slow down. So practice that with me right now. Nick, slow, yeah, give me that sign. If I start doing that, let me know. Give me that sign and I will do my best to slow down. The other one is I'm used to a much smaller stage. All this area up here is freaking me out. I'm probably gonna pace like this. So much more room for activity. I love it. I'm just going to run back and forth as I'm talking, and that's okay. Who got the reference? You guys? All right. I'm not going to do a cartwheel. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about the rhythm of growth. Now, we've talked about a whole bunch of different rhythms in the last few weeks. I think that's really cool. It's a really fun series. I think this is neat. Luckily, Pastor Art is so kind, he let me pick which one I got to talk about because some of the other ones kind of scared me. But this one I like a lot, the rhythm of growth, because I love trying to find ways to grow closer to God in my life. I love trying to find ways to be closer to my Savior, Jesus. Um, so when I started thinking about this and praying about this, I had a hard time because I don't think there's a rhythm to it. Now, maybe you disagree and that's okay, but in my life, I have not yet found a rhythm to how often I, I grow closer to God. Now, when I think of rhythm, I think of a song, right? And it has like a beat pattern or something and it's, things happen every so often. There's beats per minute or however that goes, a quarter beat, half beat, all that kind of stuff. I don't see like a, a specific perfect rhythm to how I grow closer to God. Instead, it's been much more of a bumpy ride. And I want to share this next slide with you. Um, one of my students, Austin, over here, I think sh shared this on Facebook a while ago. Go and hit that slide for me. This is closer to how it looks to me growing closer to God. Your plan, like, yeah, I'm just going to start growing closer to God. It's going to be great. His plan, nothing like that. There are pits and valleys and mountains and areas with a little bit of blue water and a boat and storms and a bridge and all sorts of other stuff. That is so much closer to how I've grown closer to God and how most people I've seen have grown closer to God. If, if you're closer to the bottom, can you shake your head at me like, yeah, that's kind of how it goes for me too. You know what's funny is I find that I grow closer to God more so fr from the valleys than the hilltops. It's when you go through something very difficult. It's when you have something taken away from your life that you once enjoyed or when God does something big in your life that I tend to grow the most. It's painful usually, but it's ultimately better for us in the long run. Uh, there are lots of verses I would love to, to go even deeper into that, especially in James. I think it's James 1 I'm reading right now. Yeah, it talks about that. I won't get too much into that today, but I wanted to kind of look at the rhythm of growth and how this thing works. Now, when I look at this graph, it reminds me of something from high school. One of the only things that I paid attention to well in economics was the graph of how America's economy moves up and down. I don't know why I like graphs. Um, I think they're just neat, fun to look at. And one, it, it talked about this, this graph on how Amer America's economy does something like this. It's kind of a graph that goes up, but it does so in a bumpy way. It goes down sometimes, and there's recessions, and it goes up sometimes. But the goal is, and this is working, is for the recessions to get shorter and not to dip as deep, and the areas of prosperity to get higher and last longer. I think our spiritual lives ought to look very similar. I know mine does. I am trying to not have as many recessions spiritually in my life, and I'm trying to, to have those hilltop experiences last longer, if at all I can. I think that's a wonderful analogy. It's not exactly a rhythm, but I think it's maybe a pattern. Maybe it's, it's a, a plan of how we tend to grow closer to God. And I'm okay with that. So if we're going to look at these, these valleys and these areas where we're going to grow more from when God takes things away from us, there's one specific passage, I think, that, that, that talks to this very, very nicely. It's John 15, 1 through 5. If you have a Bible, go ahead and pop it open. If not, it's going to be on the screen anyway. There it is. We're going to read this real quick. And this is going to kind of give us an idea of what we're talking about today. And it's the idea that God sometimes prunes us. We're going to dig into that more. Read this verse along with me, would you? It says, I am the true vine. This is Jesus talking, by the way. I have read letters in my Bible, so I always know that's kind of handy. But as you read this, remember, this is Jesus talking. I am the true vine, and my father is the keeper of the vineyard. My father examines every branch in me and cuts away those who do not bear fruit. He leaves those bearing fruit and carefully prunes them so that they will, be, so that they will bear more fruit. Already you are clean because you have heard my voice. Next slide, please. Abide in me, and I will abide in you. A branch cannot bear fruit if it is disconnected from the vine, and neither will you if you are not connected to me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. If you abide in me, and I in you, you will bear great fruit. Without me, you will accomplish nothing. I love this passage. There is so much to this. Literally, I think we could spend like 
uh, six months studying just these five verses, and that would be cool. We're not gonna do that. I'm gonna try to cover it in about 30 minutes, but we're gonna do it. I talk fast, it's okay, right? So we're gonna try to really figure out what it means to be pruned. That's the main chunk of this passage I wanna focus on. Now, of course, it's talking about we cannot bear fruit. We cannot do things for God without Jesus. Quite literally, we are useless or, or in some ways in wrath or against God until we have Christ in our lives. He's talking about that. When we are with God, when we are abide in the branch, which is the, Jesus, we can actually do things for God, which I think is really, really cool. But the key is to this that I want to look at is what it means to be pruned. Now, real quick, I got another slide for you. I want to look at the cast of characters. As I move forward, we need to know what these things represent. This is kind of a miniature parable. And so a parable is like a parallel. He's paralleling an analogy to our lives. So the vine, obviously, is Christ. He says that up front. I am the true vine. So the vine is Christ. The gardener or the vine dresser, I've seen a lot of different translations for this, but the guy that's doing the pruning here is obviously God. Branches are us. We are believers. We are the things that get to bear fruit. We get to bear fruit for God. And lastly, fruit. This is probably the trickiest one I definitely want to identify. Fruit are good works. Fruit are things that we get to bear that actually help the body of Christ, actually help people come to know Christ. Things that actually help uh, God. Things, I don't say help God, but things that serve God. Those are fruits. So if you take notes, I'm not going to write those down. They're going to become in handy in just a minute here. But I really want to focus on fruits for just a minute and how we identify them, how we know what fruits are. And I think the simplest and best way to identify those things would be um, the fruits of the Spirit. Now, I know a lot of people probably have those things memorized. Hit that slide for me. we got a verse that will show you what the fruits of the Spirit are. But before I read this, I want to tell you a quick story. Because when people memorize the fruits of the Spirit, a lot of people I know have this memorized— they often rattle them off real fast. Fruits of the Spirit are peace, joy, love, patience, all that kind of stuff. And it's great. It's wonderful to memorize this verse or memorizing the fruits of the Spirit. But sometimes when verses get memorized and repeated back, they tend to lose their meaning. Have you, have you ever memorized a verse and then said it so fast that it almost doesn't have any meaning anymore? God's love the world. He gives only begotten son. They all believe in him. Shall not perish. Shall not perish. life. And that, that's how a lot, of, especially young people, tend to memorize verses. They just say it so dang quick. Yeah, I'm slow I meant to do that one. That was fast on purpose. But that's how a lot of people, that was John 3.16 if you're with me at all. Um, they tend to memorize verses and they say them back real fast. Or if they're not fast, they tend to lose their meaning. Jesus said that I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. Did that really do anything for you? Not me. So here's what I did. I was in California, had a group of disciples, um, some really cool high school guys I loved, good dudes, and we would challenge them to memorize verses each week. Well, the memory verse was John 14, 6, the one I just said that you probably don't remember because I made it sound really boring. So I would challenge my guys. They would say it like that. I said, when, when you memorize a verse and you recite it back to me, I want you to remember that you're proclaiming the power of God. These are the true living words of God right here. And don't you dare come back and recite them like they're the alphabet. These are things that your Lord and Savior are saying. I want you to say them with conviction, like you mean it, like you know it, like you're living it. So one student in particular took me very serious. His name was Jamie. Great kid. He comes back, and we hadn't really talked. We talked about that the week before. And so then the next week comes up, and I hadn't said it again. I hadn't said the whole conviction thing. I said, hey, who's got your memory verse uh, memorized this time? Jimmy goes, I'll do it. All right, cool, man, go ahead. He stand, we're all sitting down. He stands up, kind of puffs his chest out, and goes, and Jesus replied, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. Like, Jamie, that was fantastic. No, I'm, I'm applauding Jamie, not me. It was amazing. I was like, dude, you just nailed it. So... When we read some of these verses, do me a favor. Let them sink in. Read them slowly, which is hard for me because I want to talk fast. But actually give these things the authority and the power that they come with. We're going to talk about the fruits of the Spirit. These are things that God lets us produce for Him, which is kind of a conundrum, but a good one. So as you read this, stick with me here because these are some powerful, immense, awesome words. Galatians 5, and 23 says, The Holy Spirit produces a different kind of fruit, unconditional love, joy, peace, patience, kind-heartedness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You won't find any law opposed to fruit like this. I think this is the voice translation, so if you memorize them in a different translation, that's totally okay. They're the same words, they have the same power, and we're going to dig more into these in just a little bit, but I want to make sure we understood clearly that these are the fruits of the Spirit. When John 15 talks about, as Christians, as believers, we get to bear fruit. It's not using that word lightly. We get to bear fruit means we get to do something awesome for God. Let us not take that lightly at all, but let us have a full perspective on how powerful these words are and how awesome these fruits are. So as we're looking at the rhythm of growth, I'm looking at this from the perspective of being pruned because the verse says that if we are pruned, we can bear even more fruit. That we get to be even more productive for God. 
which I think is fantastic. And that's something I definitely want in my life. I want to produce more love, joy, peace, patience, that kind of stuff. Those are things that I would very much so like to have. And if that means cutting some things out of my life so that I can have more of those, I'll take that. See, that's the analogy. If you look at a, at a, a, a vineyard or um, a grapevine, I just found that I have grapes in my backyard. I didn't even know that. Isn't that funny? I was preparing for this message and we're totally redoing our backyard. I'm like, hey, I think this is a grapevine. Oh, neat. It's kind of cool. It kind of applies. So as we look at this thing, we're going to use the analogy of the grapevine over and over again. And I think that's a good idea. This is a very good parallel for me. And so as I was looking at this thing, trying to figure out that the whole analogy of, you know, God takes us as the branch and we're producing fruit for him, but some areas are not so healthy in our life. Some of these areas aren't producing fruit. He trims them away. I had to go look up some of this gardening stuff. My thumbs are not green. I am not a gardener. I can't grow anything. I can take care of my dog. That's about it. So I had to look this stuff up. I had to figure out how this whole planting and growing thing works. And as I did so, I was reminded that as Jesus spoke, his hearers got this well. People he was spoken he was spoken to. How does that make sense? The people he was speaking to totally got this. Some of the uh, commentaries I looked up said that they were probably walking near the temple, and there were often vine branches hanging down from the temple. So it's very possible that as Jesus was speaking, he was showing his disciples, "Look, grapes. I'm talking about these." They totally got it. Um, growing vineyards and that kind of stuff was very very common back then. So Jesus was probably the best person ever at using simple good analogies that people understood. I wish I understood this a little more. I've never grown grapes before. I guess I'm going to start, apparently, because we have a grape in our backyard. But it made a lot of sense to them. But for me, I had to do a little bit of study. So as I'm studying this whole idea of pruning away dead areas so that the fruitful areas can become even more fruitful, I figured out, this is simple biology, but it took me a little bit, there are three things plants need to grow. And we're going to look at these things and try to parallel them to our lives. Three simple th things for photosynthesis to take, to take place. That's hard to say. Photosynthesis to take place. So the three simple things that plants need are water, sunlight, and soil. Hit that first slide for me. I want to compare water to money in our lives because a plant gets a lot of water sometimes. Other times it doesn't get as much. But a plant doesn't always know how much water it's going to get. There are some times when it's a plenty rainy season and the plant has plenty of water. And if it wastes some of its resources on the dead areas, it may not be that big of a deal because there's still plenty of water to produce and hydrate the, the fruits of the same vine. I think the same thing is true in our life. I think sometimes money in our lives, we, we don't know how much we're going to get or how well we're going to be able to allocate it in our life. There are some things that might take up tons of our money, but it's okay because we're actually making pretty good money right now. I hope. That would be nice. But if we look at this carefully, I think sometimes... There's not as much money in our life. Sometimes we don't know when this is going to happen. Sometimes we don't know when we're going to get fired, when there's going to be a recession, when you're going to have a huge uh, a bill for your house or something, uh, or you don't know when you're going to win the lottery. Wouldn't that be great? We don't always know if we're going to have a lot of money available in our lives. That's why I like to parallel this one so nicely to water, because plants have the same issue. Now, for me, there was something in my life some time ago that God pruned away, something that was taking up a lot of my money. It was paintball. Now, I love paintball. Paintball is a ton of fun. You get to shoot people with paint pellets, and they hit you, and they splat, and they leave a bruise, and they actually hurt. So it's like you're actually scared to get shot, which makes it that much more fun. It is just an absolute blast. I love th this hobby. It was, it was so much fun for me. Uh, in California, I actually worked at a paintball course. I was a referee there. And eventually, we got so into it, me and some other guys, that we ended up uh, joining a league. It was a semi-pro league. So I was on a team that was actually very, very competitive. We got into it, man. We played once a week in, in this league, league team we played in, and uh, we had to buy uh, the good paintballs. The cheap paintballs were 40 bucks for a big old box. The good ones were like 80 bucks. So I started spending about 80 bucks a week just for the paintballs. Then the guys on my team, man, they were competitive, and they had these fancy, fancy paintball guns. Mine didn't quite match up. I had a Bushmaster 2000. That's a big deal to me for some reason. And I started just pouring money into this paintball gun. I would upgrade every single part on it I could to make it function more effectively for me so we could be a better team. I ended up putting over $1,000 into the paintball gun, easily, over 1000 bucks into this. It's a paintball marker. Here's the key, though. I am embarrassed to say that right now. I am embarrassed to tell you that I spent $1,000 on a paintball gun. This is how much God has changed me since then. Because back then, I would brag about it. Yeah, I've got a Bushmaster 2000. It's got an upgraded regulator. It's got a new, I don't want to say Duck Dynasty, Mighty Duck Tank was what it had. It's got all these fancy things. I'll tell you all about it, Halo B Hopper, all this stuff. And I would brag about my $1,000 paintball gun because I thought that was cool. But today, it embarrasses me to say that I spent so much money on somewhat of a, a, frivol, a frivolous hobby. Um, God pruned that, that, that area of my life um, rather harshly, but I'm glad he did because there was no fruit coming from me playing paintball. 
There can be. I'm not saying paintball is evil by any means. I think it's awesome. But for me, in the league I was playing in, it, it wasn't beneficial. The guys that I played with um, were frankly pretty poor sports. After the game, if we would lose, there would be some choice words for the other team. I was trying to, to be a good example to, hey man, good game guys. The rest of my team, they were not saying that. They were not giving high fives. The guys on my team, I was trying to, to kind of share my faith with them a little bit, talk to them about some more important things in their life, ask them how they're doing, how their relationships are. They weren't interested. They just wanted to shoot people with paintballs and go home. And it wasn't bearing any fruit at all. There was, I mean, if you look at the fruits of the spirit. None of those things were coming from me playing paintball. And so um, our course closed up, went bankrupt, and it was literally no more. It was just done. Uh, our team dispersed. There was no other paintball course within two hours from my house, so it became impractical to try to keep playing. And that was something God literally just pruned, I like to do the snippy motion, pruned right out of my life. It was gone. I'm thankful that it was. Um, not, not a long time later, I had the opportunity to spend my money in some much more productive ways. Uh, a good friend of mine who was just becoming a believer, I've known him for a long time. I actually worked with him at the paintball course some time ago. Um, he started to become a believer. He started to believe in Christ for the first time. He was getting into him. And this guy, it was really cool just to see him just kind of take off. You ever see somebody start to know Christ and all of a sudden, like, it's like this little firework explosion going off. Like, and this is cool. And Jesus died for our sins over here. And then Peter was really cool. And he was going nuts over it. I love that. He was doing that. And it was really cool to get a chance to talk to him. Unfortunately, I had to move away. I moved to Arizona. Um, but he calls me later on. He calls me and we're talking about his faith on a regular basis. And he says, hey, I think I want to go on a missions trip to Africa. I'm like, whoa, it's a big step. You sure you want to do that? Yeah. Like, I, I just found this whole thing out that, that we don't have to go to hell. We can have Jesus in our lives and go to heaven because he died on the cross for us. I want to go share that with people now. I'm like, oh, then go, man. That's awesome. We should totally do that. And so he ends up writing me a support letter, as often mission, uh, missionaries do. They'll write letters asking for funds to help support them go on these trips. So I, I had a little bit of extra money. I was able to help support my friend. I'm very proud to say that. I used to be proud to say I've got a $1,000 paintball gun. I've been pruned. I, I, God's helped me grow. And now I'm proud to say that I was able to help my friend get to Africa and, sh and share Jesus with some people. It's fantastic. Uh, that, that, for me, that's growth. That's being pruned in, in the right way. Another friend of mine was starting a church, which I thought was fantastic. I had to help him start a church a little bit. Or one of my favorite ways to use money as a way to produce fruits, I think we can do that, is to just go to lunch with people. I love finding people and just say, hey, let's just go to lunch. Especially for guys, I think this is a big one because guys are notoriously bad at talking. We, we do not like to sit down and say, hey man, how's your life going? How are things going with you? We're just bad at that. We, we, we just talk about superficial stuff. Unless you can get guys to actually sit down and not have anything distracting going on. Eventually, they'll have to start talking about something remotely interesting. So we start talking about family and faith and what's God teaching you right now. That's a stereotypical youth pastor question, by the way. So I'll probably, if I ever sit down with him and ask you that, hey, what's God teaching you right now? I think it was, it was Chad who had a, a, a pre-canned response for me. I haven't been asked that for a long time. And he had his full response laid out because he knows that's the stereotypical youth pastor question. But one of my favorite ways to grow with people is to spend money on lunch. Not an expensive lunch, but just have, or even coffee. Just have a chance to sit down with somebody and ask them about their life. What's God doing in your life right now? What are you struggling with? Those are ways I think we can produce fruit quite easily and can be infinitely more productive than a useless paintball game in, in, my, in my area anyway. And the next one I want to look at is sunlight. Now, plants, of course, need sunlight to grow. And I like this one a lot compared to energy because you only get so much of that per day. Every day you get, what, 14, 16 hours of sun? I have no idea. I'm guessing on this. Um, but you only get so much. There's only a very specific limited amount that plants get per day. And if they use that on the wrong stuff, they're not going to grow as effectively. If they use that on the dead areas of the vine, they're not going to grow well. Same thing is true with us. We only get so much energy in the day. I know, because I, I've, I've hit the E button, right? Have you, ever, have you ever, seriously for a minute, have you ever done so much stuff in a day where you literally are out of gas and you just crash? You just fall over because you are so stinking tired. That's not a fun thing to do. I've only done that a handful of times in my life, and they're all related to youth ministry, I think. Um, <laughs> usually when you do an overnight, you spend 24 hours with students, you do a bunch of crazy stuff, and then you get home at like nine in the morning, you just fall over into a coma, and it's the best sleep you'll ever get. That, that is running out of energy for me, and it's, it's fun, but it's scary. Um, God had to prune something out of my life in this area as well. See, for me, I, I have a, a strange addiction, not like that show, one of the weird ones. One of my addiction is late night TV. I love talk shows. I love Conan O'Brien. Uh, I'm, I'm starting to get used to Jimmy Fallon. He's all right. Um, I like, um, what's the other guy? Uh, Jimmy Kimmel. He's cool. The new guy from SNL, um, 
Seth Meyers, he's, 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 he's hanging in there. Um, but I like these guys. Uh, Conan's my favorite by far. Conan cracks me up. But I will, I will literally stay up until 3 o'clock in the morning watching all of these shows. Most normal people will watch one. They'll pick one of these things and watch an hour of, of, of late night TV, and that's fine. Not me. Like, that was funny. Next. Next. And, of course, now we have, like, Netflix and Hulu. We don't do cable anymore. We just switch to those things. And everything's already on there for you. So there's, you never run out of things to watch, and that's dangerous. That is so dangerous. So... Multiple times in my life, have, have, God's pruned this away, and then it tends to grow back, and I have to be careful with it. I think it's okay, and it's not bad to watch these shows. They're not inherently wrong or anything. But for me, I can spend too much time watching them. I can stay up till 3 o'clock in the morning, then the next morning, my alarm goes off, and I just don't hear it. Or I, in my sleep, shut it off and have no recollection of doing so. Or I go to wherever I'm supposed to go, be at a meeting, or at the time in my life, it's been school, and I'm so stinking tired when I get there, I'm useless. I have done these kinds of things multiple times. Or one of the worst things that happens in this case is um, my time with God I like to spend at night. A lot of people like to have time they spend with God on a regular basis every day. A lot of people do it in the morning. In the morning, they will get up, they will read the Bible, and they will spend some time in prayer. Fantastic. For me, I am not a morning person. If I wake up at 7, I really wake up at 10. So what I do is I like to do my time with God in the evening before I go to bed. I, I am most alert. So like this whole thing right now, me talking fast and being energetic, is pure caffeine. I'm not awake yet. This is a lie. But... <laughs> In the evening, I am naturally awake. I am most creative. I am most, uh, in my opinion, in tune with God or I want to talk to God and I want to pray and read. And that's fine. I think that's great. You can, you can do that time of day whenever you want to. Do it at noon. It doesn't matter. But I think it's great to have a time of day where you spend time with God on a regular basis. I think that's fantastic. But for me, at three o'clock in the morning, after I've watched like four hours of useless TV, I'm like, oh yeah, I got to spend time with God now. I'm going to start reading. I start fall asleep reading my Bible. and That's not good. So obviously that's an area where that was a dead area in my life that needs to be pruned away. And uh, sometimes I, I've been good about getting this sucker pruned away and I, I, I am disciplined to get myself to go to bed on time. And other times I fall victim and just keep watching TV over and over again. Uh, something I'm actually doing okay on right now. I'm getting better, but I'm trying to get even better. The last one is probably the most difficult one for me to talk about, soil. Now, soil for me looks a lot like time. And I'm glad Nikki talked about this earlier because... When a plant uh, grows or hatches or whatever, you, I don't know what the term is, when it comes into existence, when a plant sprouts, a sprout, that's a good word, right? Sprouts, we'll use that one. When a plant sprouts up for the first time, it has only the amount of soil that it's around it. It cannot get up and walk away unless it's in the Lord of the Rings. It's a tree. Those things are cool. But normal plants that aren't Tolkien-based, normal plants cannot move. They are stuck right where they are, and they only get the amount of soil that is currently located to them. I think the same thing is true with us. We only get so much time in this world. Nikki talked about it beautifully in that poem. That was wonderful. We only get so much time on this earth. We're not going to get any more. We only get to use it exactly how we use it right now. And that's it. It's done. It's over. Which is why it's, it, when, when, I, when I reflect on this, it's kind of scary to me. I'm like, man, what am I doing? Why am I watching so much late night TV? Uh, you know, that kind of stuff. Because I think I should be doing so much more with my time. Well, there's an area of my life that was sucking up my time unfruitfully. And God needed to, to to trim away. Uh, for me, that was the fire department. I pursued a lot of careers before I finally gave in to God's call to, to, to being a pastor. Um, one of them was emergency response. I went, went for, uh, for the police department for a while, um, really liked the whole law, enfor law enforcement uh, atmosphere, but didn't like some of the things that came along with it, and finally thought I had found my calling in, in firefighting. So I took the fire science classes in college. I went to the fire academy, um, and I eventually got hired at, at a fire department as a reserve firefighter. Now, as a reserve, that means uh, we would get paid and we, we would work regular shifts. We'd do 24-hour shifts at the station. Um, we just weren't full-time. So we were a regular firefighter. We just didn't get full-time hours. And it was fun. I, I enjoyed it for a while. I enjoyed being a firefighter. I, I love emergency response. I love thinking on my feet, and I love helping people who are in need. So this was like right up the hour for me. A lot of things about the job I absolutely loved. But there's one time in my life I can think of when all of a sudden firefighting and, and kind of ministry kind of started to come to a head and started to clash. We were at a fall festival uh, in California, and we were on a hayride, me and my whole life team, my life group. There's a bunch of people there. Um, these are people that, that were, that they were my, my church body. They were my, my church family. I love these people. I really enjoyed spending time with them. And there was fruit to be seen from spending time with them. And we were all on, this, uh, on a hayride. It's, uh, it's a ride where they have like a big trailer and they put a bunch of hay bales on it. You sit on the hay bales, the tractor pulls you around, and you look at scary and funny and goofy stuff. And it was dumb, but it was fun. We were having a good time. We were all joking about it. And uh, I've got this, um, this radio I wear on my belt for being a reserve. All of a sudden, it starts going off, and I'm hearing about a structure fire. We're talking about a structure fire. It's not fire. I'm like, ooh, I might get called to this one. Cool. 
all of a sudden this tone goes off. There's different tones that mean different things. And it says, all reserve firefighters, structure fire at this address. Please respond. I'm like, sweet. So I literally jump off the hayride, go sprinting towards a car. And my whole life team thinks it's awesome. Yeah, Nick, go get them. They're happy for me. I, I felt kind of cool, right? I'm a firefighter, get called to a fire. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to the fire. I think I'm real cool. I go to the fire. Uh, we put the structure fire out. Nobody got hurt. Luckily, everybody got out okay. Um, and it was fine. It was cool. And um, I came home that night, smelling like smoke. And it wasn't until that night that I realized that I just took away time from my church family to do something that was ultimately unfruitful. Because firefighting, much like paintball, was an area of my life that was fine, it can be healthy, but for me at that time in my life, was not fruitful at all. So the guys that I worked with in the fire department were, were some good guys, but uh, they were really, the younger guys especially, were really into working out a lot and wearing their fire uniform to pick up chicks. And it worked pretty well for them. Um, I was engaged at the time to my beautiful wife. And uh, so I wasn't into that. And these guys were ultra competitive. And man, these guys wanted to live for the fire department. I mean, they were literally all about firefighting. I was not. I was trying to be all about Jesus. I was trying to be all about my faith. And firefighting was just going to be a career for me. And that was going to be a part of my life. My, my life should be based on God. I think all of our lives should be. And so I did not have much in common with these guys. The fact that I didn't want to live for the fire department made me a little bit of an outcast. It made it hard for me to really relate to these guys. There was, there was no fruit coming from it. I was not sharing my faith. I was not helping men grow. There was no fellowship. My favorite verse is Proverbs 27, 17. It says, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. None of these men were sharpening me. I wasn't sharpening any of them. And there was just no fruit coming from it at all. So finally, I decided I'm going to quit the fire department. And that was one of the hardest decisions I've ever had to make. It was extremely difficult because everybody around me sees firefighting as a noble, excellent career. And I think it is, by all means. And so most people around me were telling me, Nick, you're doing great. Be a firefighter. That's awesome. But a few key people, people like my wife, people like a couple of my mentors could see, Nick, you're not happy, are you? How, how could you tell? Like you're not really talking about the fruits that are being produced from being a firefighter. You're not sharing your faith with people. You're not helping people grow. You're not doing the things God called you to do. Yeah, I think you're right. And so I quit the fire department. It was extremely difficult for me to do. But shortly after, I, um, I was serving on youth staff, a youth volunteer at my church. The youth pastor there um, took a job elsewhere and had to leave. His position became open. I applied and got the job. Uh, I became a youth pastor and haven't looked back ever, haven't looked back ever since. Um, probably one of the... <laughs> Probably one of the uh, best decisions I've ever made um, right next to accepting Jesus and marrying the perfect woman uh, than it's going to youth ministry. Uh, I'm very, very proud of those things. I don't get a lot of things right, but those things uh, I'm, I'm pretty happy about. So we're going to wrap up here in just a little bit, but we looked at those three areas that, that plants need that we can look at as parallels in our life that we can use to bear fruit. But for a second, I want to look at the dirty areas of a vine, the areas that obviously need to be pruned. Hit that slide for me if you would. Rotting areas on a grapevine straight up stink. Rotting areas in our lives stink as well. These areas, these are areas that obviously need to be pruned. Take a notice, I not want to write that down because this is one of the key points for me. Now, being from California, I got to see a lot of vineyards. We would drive by vineyards all the time and some of them actually smelled kind of good. You have your windows down, you could smell a vineyard. It smelled kind of sweet. It's kind of, oh, that's a good vineyard. Uh, Delicato was one right near our house. It was fine. Other vineyards that weren't being tended to as often and weren't being pruned stunk. You guys ever driven by like an old vineyard? They stink. Like, it's gross. You can smell the smell of rot. You roll your windows up, turn on a research. You don't want to smell that. It's nasty. I love that analogy because I think it parallels well in our lives. There are some areas of our lives that can be so sinful, they just straight stink. There are some areas of our lives that so obviously need to be pruned, it's undeniable. I think of areas like, like pornography or gossip or addiction or, um, or self-control when it comes to like having anger problems, that kind of stuff. Some of those areas are hard to hide. And people around you, they smell it. It stinks. If you're dealing with one of those areas right now, let me challenge you. You don't need to, to really pray about it, see if that's something God needs to prune away. And he does. That's one of those areas that you can just make the decision right now and snip that one away. Those things don't need to be in our lives, and they can cause great deals of hurt to those around us too. So that one I think is crystal clear. But I wanted to put that one up there because it contrasts nicely with the next one. Hit the next slide for me. Unfruitful areas can be hidden by leaves. And looking at these analogies, I thought was really interesting. Giving the illusion of health. Areas of our life might look good from the outside, but ultimately unfruitful. These areas require extra discernment to identify and prune. This is the one in my backyard. This is interesting. Tiff and I were looking at this, this 
vine we have, this uh, grapevine in our backyard, and it had leaves. Like, oh, cool, maybe this thing's healthy. So we go and we start to kind of peel the, the, the leaves away, and we see inside, no, these branches are dead. Some of them were rotting and not healthy. Some of them had insects and nasty bugs and stuff in them. They were not doing well. But if you were to just look on the surface, you would see these green leaves and say, that's a healthy plant. You'd be wrong. I think the same thing's very true about our lives. I know I, I'm able to hide my sins sometimes. I know a lot of people that are as well. Sometimes it's not very hard to, to put on a good front, to, to have some green leaves on the outside, to look like this area of my life is healthy. But in reality, if you peer into it a little bit deeper, you can find that it's not. I don't want to get into any too specific examples of that, but I'm guessing if you have something like that in your life, it's probably already coming to the front of your mind. We're going to get more on that in just a second. So I'm asking a lot. I'm asking that you consider having part of your life pruned. I'm asking in a minute here that we're going to reflect on and see if there's any areas of your life that might need to be pruned away. And I can tell you right now, it's not easy. It's not fun. I did not enjoy having paintball taken out of my life, nor late night TV, nor firefighting. Those were hard things, but I am ultimately much happier now that they are. I'm able to produce more fruit now because those things are gone out of my life, and I'm thankful for that. But if I'm going to ask that of you, then it better be worth it. So real quick, I want to look again at those fruits of the Spirit. Like I said before, I don't want you to take those things lightly. Please put the fruits back up there. Benefits of pruning are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. See, I did. I talked too fast, and they lost their value. Let me dissect a couple of those real quick. And think about this with me. Think about the word love up there. Or in the, the version we just read, it said unconditional love. That's agape love in Greek. Really, really powerful word. Think about it very carefully. Don't just read over that quick. Think about the word love. If you could have more love in your life, would you sacrifice some of the unfruitful areas? Now really think about that word. Think about people who you really love in your life. Your kids, your parents, a spouse, good friends. Think about that. Think about the times you've enjoyed with them most. Think about seeing your kids grow and become um, healthy in the way they treat people and becoming uh, nice young men and women. Think about all the awesome things your parents have taught you. Think about the love you've enjoyed in your life, wherever it comes from. Think about that love. Do you want more of that? I do, of course. Well, how could you not? Like, take a second and really think about these words. These are fantastic, powerful, awesome words. If I could cut away silly things like paintball to have more love in my life, absolutely. I would take that in a heartbeat. Joy. Now, joy is one of the tricky words that's uh, easily misconstrued what it means. Some people think it means a parallel to happy. It means you're happy. No, it means something a little bit deeper than that. I did a word study on joy some time ago, and I found that joy is a forward looking to the fact that we're going to get to be with our God when we die. That eventually we're going to be in heaven with God. And when you really kind of really have a, a good perspective on that, it, it gives you kind of the, uh, I don't want to say the warm fuzzies because that sounds superficial, but it makes me have this goofy looking grin I get right now. When I really think about the fact that we are someday going to be in heaven with our creator as he designed us to be, that's going to be awesome. When we really have a healthy perspective on that, that's, that is joy. Sometimes in my life, I have a better perspective on that. Sometimes I don't. But if I could have things pruned away so that I could be closer to God and feel more joy in my life, I would take that in a heartbeat. One of the best ways I like to think about joy, because it's kind of a hard thing to personify, is when you really have joy in your life, the little things don't get to you. The smaller things in your life that bug you or frustrate you don't become such a big deal. For me, a little confession of a youth pastor here, I deal with road rage. People cut me off, it drives me nuts. I get so, I, my steering wheel must be made of something really strong because I squeeze it so hard that I think it's going to snap sometimes. So sometimes when, when people cut me off and whatnot, I'm, I'm trying to peel my steering wheel off. Other times when I have joy in my life, when I'm really reflecting on how much my God loves me to send his son to die for me and I get to be in heaven and somebody cuts me off, my teeth don't grit quite as hard. I don't, be, I don't seem as angry for quite as long. And the things that usually get me so upset don't get me nearly as angry because I know there's something so much bigger and how trivial and petty my little angry driving habits become. I'm not going to go through all these. It would take too long. We could. It'd be fun. But I'm just going to hit peace last one because this is one of the most important ones for me because peace is a word we don't think of as being a fruit of the Spirit very often. We don't think of, I'm producing peace. That just seems kind of weird. But if you really think about peace in contrast to what the, the, the opposite would be, Think about turmoil. Think about being at odds with someone. Think about being at a point where you are arguing or frustrated or angry with someone in your life. Maybe a family member, maybe a coworker, maybe a spouse. I hate those feelings. I hate having animosity towards somebody. I, I mean, I don't use the word hate very often, but I absolutely hate that. I hate thinking that somebody else is thinking ill of me or that I think that I, I'm at odds with someone. I, I, will, I will call that person, hunt them down to talk to them, to get it resolved as soon as I can because I do not want to feel like that. I absolutely hate that feeling. And you don't really value peace 
until you have real turmoil in your life. I bet if you're thinking of right now, yeah, peace is great. I like peace. But when you think about it in the contrast of, of what the opposite would be, or when you're actually in the midst of having that turmoil in your life where, where you're absolutely frustrated and angry with someone, I can't believe they would say or do that. When you have that going on, I bet you desire peace then, don't you? I do. I, I would absolutely love to have more peace in my life. And if I could have more of these things in my life by pruning away some of the other things, by all means, I would take it. Absolutely. So, just a minute here. I'm going to be quiet for about 10 seconds. It'll seem like an eternity for me. But, and I want, I want you guys to think about, I want you to really think about, or if you want to pray about an area in your life you think might need to be pruned. Take a few minutes and really just kind of consider what needs to be pruned, pruned out of your life. And it could, be, it could be something that looks kind of healthy, like the green leaves, or it could be something that is obviously rotten and stinky and needs to be gone. It could be, I mean, it could be uh, one of the big crazy things, like a career choice for me. Or it could be a, a fruitless hobby like paintball. Or it could just be a TV show that, that's taken up too much of your time. I don't know. In your life, it could be, it look totally different, and that's okay. But I want you to take about 10 seconds right now in silence and just think about something that maybe God wants to prune from your life. Let's do that now. Felt like forever, didn't it? So... If you're anything like me, something came to mind. Probably something has been in your mind since I started talking. You probably had something in the back of your mind that's like, well, maybe that. But you probably did the same thing I do. You tried to rationalize it. You thought, maybe this thing needs to be pruned out of my life. No, but wait. I get to see a lot of people that don't know Jesus yet in that area of my life. Maybe I'll get a chance to, to share my faith with them. Or you thought, you know, maybe I should take this area out of my life. But wait, I might be able to use that to help my church someday, maybe. There's probably some way you're trying to rationalize the thing that popped in your head that might need to be pruned away. If that's you right now, I'm going to challenge you to say that's probably, that rationalization is probably a good sign that it needs to be pruned away. At the end of this, in just a couple minutes here, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray that God prunes my life. Again, I'm going to invite you to pray along with me, but do not take it lightly. At the end of a prayer, most people say, thank you, amen. Um, I did a word study on that as well. I think it's a really neat word, amen. Amen means I agree. It means I want what that person is saying they want. I've been guilty of this. I have not listened to someone else pray, halfway fall asleep, probably because it's early in the morning, and then they say, amen, I go, amen, yeah. And I just prayed for something I don't know what I prayed for because I said I agree. I told God I want that too. I hope they don't pray for anything too weird because I just said I want that. So when I say amen, and if you say amen with, with me, do not take it lightly. Be careful what you pray in this time. I'm going to pray for God to prune me, and I can tell you right now, being pruned can be painful. It can be difficult. It is worth it by all means, but it can be very hard. I'll give you one quick example. Um, one of my students in California named Jacob, tall, skinny, goofy kid, love him to death. He's hilarious. Um, he's kind of like me. He's a computer nerd. I'm a, I'm a total geek. He played a bunch of computer games. I think at the time he was playing World of Warcraft or something. Uh, we talked about this kind of thing. It was a different version. We talked about being pruned. And he said amen. He wanted to be pruned. The very next week, I see him in church. He walks in kind of moping. I'm like, dude, what's up? What's wrong? He's, I got pruned. <laughs> I was like, that's awesome. What happened? He's like, all my computers broke. <laughs> like, yes, I'm sorry to hear that, but I'm not because it's awesome. That's so stinking cool. And he ultimately ended up spending more of his time doing more productive, more fruitful things. I mean, he still uses computers now. He's not like sworn off computers or anything. But at the time, God pruned something out of his life. God answered his prayer. And all he said was amen. So I, I, I give you that forewarning. What we're about to do here could be somewhat uh, surprising and interesting. I've had God answer a lot of really neat prayers lately. So, um, it's a good time to be praying for stuff like this. So I'm going to pray. And if you'd like to, pray along with me. Pray out loud if you want. Pray silently in, in your own head. Or just simply listen to what I say. And if you agree, if you want that in your life too, utter that word. But do so cautiously. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for an opportunity to, to stand on the stage and hopefully uh, share your word accurately. God, um, you've uh, pruned me in some amazing ways in the past. And I pray that you would do so again. I pray, God, that you would identify areas of my life that are not productive, that are not fruitful, that are not serving you well. Even if they're areas that I cling to, even if they're areas that I think maybe are fruitful, God, you know better than me. If those are areas you would like me to prune away, that you would like out of my life so that I can be more productive for you in other areas, make that clear to me, God, and prune them. I'm giving you permission right now, God, to help me grow by pruning me in whatever way you would see fit. 
I love you, Father. I thank you for this time. It's in your son Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Nick.